Good morning. I'm Dr. Camille Hammond from the Cake Foundation, and I am here to welcome you to Coffee with Kay, where we're going to have a great present conversation about fertility preservation for cancer patients and survivors. I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Mindy Christensen, the director of the Johns Hopkins Fertility Center and the medical director for their Fertility Preservation Center. Uh, Dr. Christensen, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is fertility preservation. Awesome. Well, let's get right in. So what is fertility preservation and how does it specifically support patients, cancer patients and survivors? Yeah, so fertility preservation can involve, it involves really preserving someone's biologic material. This can include eggs, it can include embryos, ovarian tissue. For males, it can include sperm or even testicular tissue. But really it's preserving this material so in the future, the person can use it to have a biological child. And I think that we have talked a little bit in the past about fertility preservation for adults and the things that you've described are very similar. How does that relate to children who are not yet of reproductive age? Yes, so for fertility preservation, it really varies. The option is gonna depend on whether the patient, for especially for females, started to have periods or not. So if we have a young girl who's prepubertal who hasn't started having periods, it's not possible to freeze eggs. Otherwise, typically freezing eggs would be our kind of our gold standard fertility preservation modality. But for younger patients where that's not possible, or even patients who could freeze their eggs but just don't have the time because of the treatment that they need to have, ovarian tissue cryopreservation preservation is a really good option. It's an option because we can harvest the ovarian tissue. It can often be combined with another procedure, such as placing a chemotherapy port. So it can be done relatively rapidly and the patient can start her treatment right away after the tissue is harvested. The tissue can then be frozen and stored for future use. And is that something that you would also consider in a reproductive age woman or would you only do the egg freezing or the egg uh, cryopreservation? In, in general, egg freezing is going to be the best option for the majority of patients, but there are some patients where it's just not an option. They don't have enough time or for various reasons, they've decided not to um, freeze oocytes. And in that situation, freezing ovarian tissue, although it's a newer technology, is an option that's available. So when a uh, person is diagnosed with cancer, um, how long usually do they have? If, they, if they're told they need to have chemotherapy or they need to start treatment relatively quickly, how long does it take for them to get into you know, queue or to begin the fertility preservation process? So fertility preservation is recognized as a really important survivorship issue. Because of that, oncologists are more and more recognizing immediately the importance of a fertility preservation consultation. Centers like our center and many other centers see these patients as a priority. So we will see them at our center within two business days because it's really important to see these patients, offer them fertility preservation, and if it's feasible, to get started on the process. If a patient wanted to, let's say she decided to do oocyte crowd preservation, that will take typically two weeks or so at a minimum to provide medication to stimulate the ovaries and then perform the egg retrieval. And so the patient needs to be able to delay her treatment in most cases about two weeks, two to three weeks, kind of depending on other factors. So if they wanted to do egg freezing. Okay, for egg freezing. And what about... I know in the past there have been, uh, the recommendation was to freeze an embryo if you were in a relationship and you, you thought that you would want to have children with this person in the future. Is that the, still the recommendation? Yeah, so for freezing embryos, um, and it's, it's becoming less common today just because egg freezing is so successful and so efficient, but with embryo crowd preservation, let's say it's a, it's a patient who's married, had maybe already been trying to conceive, um, in her situation, she may choose to freeze embryos or a combination of embryos and eggs. In that situation, it would still be the same amount of time um, to move forward to get to the point of egg retrieval. And what are the costs of uh, fertility preservation if you decide to have egg freezing 
or embryo freezing? So the cost of fertility preservation is going to depend on many factors. Number one, because Maryland and some other states are have state mandates for fertility preservation treatment, they may have insurance coverage. So unfortunately, that is sometimes part of the delay in starting, waiting for the insurance coverage to proceed with treatment. But insurance coverage is one issue. Um, if a patient needed to pay out of pocket, there are also resources such as the Livestrong Foundation, which can um, subsidize the costs. So it really varies. If we have patients that um, have subsidized costs, the cost for egg freezing or embryo freezing can be between four and $5,000. Um, and they may get their medication for free. Those are patients who qualify if patients have insurance, it may be covered. Um, at Hopkins, we will really try to work as much as possible to make things financially easier for the patient. Um, so we'll work through all options with them. And you mentioned Hopkins. How can someone who has a need or who knows of someone who may benefit, how can they get uh, more information? How can they follow up? So um, one easy way is really just to Google um, Hopkins and fertility preservation. We have a fertility preservation website. On that website, you can learn about the treatments we have, and you can actually request an appointment directly on that website. So that's really the easiest way to request a consultation, even for patients who need to be seen urgently. Um, it's linked to an email address that we check, you know, check frequently during the day so we can get patients in right away. Okay, let's take a little bit of a turn. Let's say someone decides that they don't want to have fertility preservation because of timing, because of cost, because of any number of factors, and then they are now survivors of cancer. Can you talk a little bit about what is available to them that now, you know, understanding they may not have some of the same body parts as they would have prior to uh, cancer treatment? Yeah, absolutely. So a large part of the patients we see may be patients after cancer. So sometimes we have patients who don't have the opportunity to undergo fertility preservation. Let's say they have a hematolog hematologic malignancy such as leukemia, so they had to start their chemotherapy right away. So when we see those patients for consultation, we want to kind of evaluate where their current fertility is and what their goals are. Sometimes we're able to do like a rescue fertility preservation procedure and maybe freeze eggs after treatment. Sometimes there can be eggs left. Um, so we kind of want to look at those options and see. Um, if let's say a patient unfortunately develops ovarian failure or ovarian insufficiency after treatment, then donor egg may still be an option. If a patient needs to undergo a surgery such as a hysterectomy, she may still be able to use a gestational carrier. So there are you know, many options, just like there's many options for many pathways to parenthood, there can be many options after cancer treatment or other types of treatments that are damaging to fertility. So it's, I think it's important to see a fertility specialist to discuss those options. Absolutely. Now we focused a lot on women and I know we don't have much time left, but can you talk a little bit about what is available to males, young men, uh, reproductive age men, and then also men who and this is people who have not yet undergone treatment. And then also uh, after they have undergone treatment, what's available to them? So, so for males undergoing um, tr you know, treatment that can be damaging to fertility, the gold standard, if it's possible, would be sperm crop preservation. And that's something where we'll see patients within a day or two to help facilitate the sperm crop preservation. So that would be the best option. And if possible, if they could have two collections, that's optimal so that we have a a nice amount of sperm for the future to use. So that's one option. Unfortunately, for prepubertal boys or boys who haven't reached puberty, there is um, testicular tissue crowd preservation. This is still considered experimental. There's only a, a few centers worldwide that do that. So that's really an emerging option um, for that group. If a male does freeze sperm for future fertility, in the future, it's generally can be used um, with IVF, sometimes with um, IUI, but really we would recommend IVF just because there's only a limited amount of sperm available. And the sperm would be collected through masturbation. Correct. Yes. Okay. And then so for men who don't undergo the treatment and then they end up becoming infertile as a result of the treatment, donor, donor sperm? Yeah, donor sperm is also an option as well. Um, that they that they could definitely look at, and that's um, something that's 
um, easily accessible in the United States and a lot of people choose that option. So thank you for bringing that up. And what about um, testicular, you know, surgery? Do you ever have men or, you know, can you talk a little bit about the men that end up having the surgery to go that um, looks for sperm? Yeah, so if we have a patient that has like a very low sperm supply, um, what we'll do is we'll refer them to a reproductive urologist, but there are testicular um, surgeries that can be done called the TESI where they can actually do micro dissection of the testes to look for sperm as well. So if a man has a very low sperm supply, that is an option. But what we would do is I would refer that patient to a reproductive urologist. Awesome. Well, Dr. Christensen, I know you've already told me that you are, are going to be doing an emergent uh, surgery on a young woman who has cancer this morning. So this topic is of particular relevance. Um, are there any parting words that you have for anyone who either is struggling with cancer or has a loved one that is struggling and that is thinking about whether or not they should preserve their fertility? Yeah, my strong recommendation is it's, it's really important if you're even considering it is to get a consultation because we're happy to consult with you. People at other centers are as well because there are multiple options available and we want to tailor those options to the individual patients. So my biggest recommendation is to call for consultation because we're happy to help. Thank you so much. Again, this is Dr. Mindy Christensen, the medical director for the Johns Hopkins Fertility Preservation Center and uh, the director for the, uh, the Johns Hopkins Fertility Center. Did I mess that up? Did I say that wrong? Well, I'm the medical director for the Johns Hopkins Fertility Center and I'm the director of fertility preservation, so both. Okay, yeah. okay so uh, thank you so much, Dr. Christensen.